As technology has advanced over the years, online data and digital information has become intertwined with our lives and businesses more than ever before. Yet, demand for consumer privacy is at its highest. So, in an ever-changing digital environment where online information is at its most prevalent, how do companies safeguard all the sensitive user data they need to collect? Today, we'll be talking to Jotform's Head of Information Security, Johanna Swickland, to find out. Welcome to Momentum, a podcast by Jotform, where we talk about the technology, productivity tips, insights, and best practices that help us move forward in business and in life. Let's get started. Uh, all right, so I am here with Johannes Wickland, uh, head of information security here at Jotform, talking about how companies like ours can keep their data safe, or at least how they should keep their data safe. Uh, Johannes, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here, Elliot. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, so obviously, this is a hot button topic in today's day and age and can really uh, make or break a company or at least its reputation. Uh, we've all heard of data breaches or even been involved in them ourselves. So I, I think it's safe to say that general awareness around data security has probably never been higher than it is today. Uh, so obviously, as head of information security at a software company like Jotform that relies on data collection to operate, uh, that does bear some some responsibility. Do you may want to start out just explaining sort of in layman's terms for those who may not be too familiar, just exactly what information security is and why it's important? Sure. So in a nutshell, it's really about protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of uh, the systems and uh, networks that uh, essentially the data resides on and that serves up the software functionality that, that we provide to our customers. So there's a lot of layers to that, obviously, but um, on a data security aspect, we have to make sure that the data doesn't get compromised, that uh, the data is only available to the authorized users. No one else can uh, edit the data or uh, download data that doesn't belong to them. So. Um, those are kind of the main functional requirements, if you will. And, and what do we do? Um, well, basically, I r manage a program that constitutes a number of different things uh, across the areas of people, process, and technology, uh, really looking at um, you know, application security, infrastructure security, um, as well as compliance to make sure that we comply with all the uh, legal and regulatory frameworks. Right. So there's there's obviously, even from that answer, a lot of layers and a lot that goes into uh, information security in general. What is, I mean, what's really the, the risk? What's at stake, I guess, if a company doesn't take data security seriously? Like, why, why is there so much fuss these days around uh, information security, would you say? Well, I think, you know, one aspect certainly is there's liability. So if you are a company, let's say um, you're collecting customer data for a variety of purposes, and that customer data then gets exposed to the internet, uh, let's say you have social security numbers, as an example, if you're a US-based company and those um, security, social security numbers associated with names get exposed, you as uh, the data owner actually have a liability where now you may have to pay for credit monitoring for those individuals and you may have to report uh, breaches to various regulatory authorities, right? So mm -hmm. owning a data, owning any kind of data, especially personal data, comes with a lot of responsibility. And that's really why it's a big deal. Um, and um, many attackers obviously take advantage of, of that and they try to extort um, data owners by um, you know, either encrypting files, uh, such as in a ransomware ca case, or um, they try to hack in and es essentially steal a company's data and then uh, will try to extort the customer to uh, not leak that data uh, on the internet. 
Right. So there, there are many attempts and, and ways out there for hackers, like you said, to to steal data. And maybe we'll we'll, we'll dive into that. Uh, I think in a second here. Maybe let's take a, a, a step back. And you know, what does your role specifically as head of information security at a software company like Jotform entail? You said you oversee several different uh, you know programs uh, that deal with different facets of of security. But I guess how would you describe your your job on a nutshell and like on a, on a daily basis? What do you what do you actually do to keep that data safe? Yeah, good question. So um, let me try to describe a couple of different facets. So first of all, as a uh, software as a service company, Jotform deploys new code updates to our public, to our consumers on a pretty frequent basis. Mm -hmm. And so every time we deploy a code update, there's a certain amount of security testing that's required because essentially there's always a risk that um, a software update may have caused a problem. So we rely on you know a combination of both automated and manual testing to uh, catch those problems before the bad guys do. Mm -hmm. um, you know and now in many cases, if a problem um, if a problem does exist, it can be theoretical, right? It's not um, doesn't necessarily mean it's exploited right away. Um, but we also invite security researchers from outside the company uh, to participate in our bug bounty program. So if someone uh, in the outside world finds a problem that we are not yet aware of, and uh, maybe it's a theoretical exploit, but um, it's meaningful enough that um, you know it, it could have been used by a bad guy, we actually uh, like when um, ethical hackers report mm. those issues to us and we actually reward uh, bug bounty hunters essentially for reporting valid bugs. Bug to bounty us. hunters. I, I've never heard of that. Is that a. Yeah, that's, that a, a, that's another word for <laughs> it's a fun name. security researchers uh, who is, are essentially working for, uh, for themselves, you know, on a. Cool. Uh, on a. Uh, essentially on a basis of. Uh, finding vulnerabilities at various companies and then being rewarded for that. So this is what so, they do. So that's, this is like their job, basically. That's what they do. Some people in a part-time, some people on a full-time basis. But um, and you know, certainly large software companies. Um, most large software companies do have these bug bounty programs, uh, where uh, security researchers are essentially invited to report. Uh, bugs and and they have various uh, reward schedules. It really depends on the severity of the bug and the um, and the um, size of the impact, right? So, th but that's only one aspect of our application security program. We also do a lot of our own uh, internal testing, both automated and manual, as I mentioned, and that's mm -hmm. you know certainly one of the pillars. Uh, for a software company is to ensure we have really good application security practices. Um, the second pillar is infrastructure security. So um, in our case, we run everything 100% in the cloud. Okay. So we don't even have any physical servers in our offices. Mm -hmm. uh, everything's running through a, a cloud provider. But uh, cloud providers have a shared security model, which essentially uh, the, the cloud provider takes care of things like physical security. But me as the cloud customer, I have to worry about network security and making sure my, my uh, servers are patched to um, withstand um, vulnerabilities. They have to be patched to the latest vulnerability and they also have to be uh, protected by network security controls. So part of my program is essentially is ensuring that our production systems are adequately protected. And then I think the third important aspect is also compliance. <clears throat> so there's a number of uh, compliance frameworks that Jotform uh, participates in. Uh, one of them is the uh, payment card industry P PCI standard, which basically any company that accepts credit card payments or is a cr credit card processor has to subscribe to. And that involves some rigorous certification testing every year. Um, but we don't stop there. We also have a HIPAA compliant version of Jotform, which essentially is subject to another set of controls um, and all of the uh, 
personal health data that our customers can gather uh, needs to be encrypted in a way that only our uh, customer can see that data. Uh, and there's some additional security measures. Uh, health information can never be sent over a plain text email, for example. So uh, by subscribing to our HIPAA uh, version, some uh, medical providers or other covered entities could uh, use JotForm as part of their business processes. So that's a certification that we strive for uh, maintaining, clearly. And since we also operate within the European Union, we are also subject to uh, the GDPR privacy laws of Europe. And essentially, if you're a European JotForm customer, you can elect to have all of your JotForm data stored on a, a server that's inside of the EU, um, and essentially uh, not uh, export that data outside of uh, the union. So uh, <clears throat> basically my compliance function has to con continually assess our processes to make sure that we are compliant with uh, these mm -hmm. frameworks. Okay, okay. So that was a lot, even, even right there between... Uh Coding, compliance, infrastructure, PCI compliance, HIPAA compliance, European Union uh, compliance. I mean, it's got to be hard to, where do you even start with all that? Do you just have teams under you who their only job is to facilitate this, update it, update you know, code or whatever it takes? Or do you have, is this just sort of ingrained in every single engineer's function that every single team has to keep this in mind? Or do you have teams dedicated to it? I guess, how does it work at a company? It's a, sure it it's a great question. So I think, yeah, you know, first of all, I have a lot of um, smart individuals who, who have the ability to multitask and can definitely add value in, in several of these areas. Uh, we are also a small, um, you know, organization, so um, it's it's pretty lean and mean. So it's not, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have large teams for each of these functions. But I did recently streamline uh, the group so that those three functions are each a separate function under a separate team lead because um, it will allow uh, my my individuals to focus a little more right. on kind of their core mission while everybody on the whole team still have shared responsibilities around security operations and uh, response to any um, inquiries or issues. Okay, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, I assume a, a, a large company like a, a Microsoft has entire departments just dedicated to, to facets and components like this. Um, and obviously, you know, we're not that size yet, but uh, that makes sense. I think to take an example, Again, just to get an idea of how this works, let's take HIPAA compliance. So we have a HIPAA compliant product for um, silver users and above, uh, which is very vital for our healthcare industry users. Um, I guess, could you just take a little subset example and talk a little bit about what it takes to be HIPAA compliant and maintain our HIPAA compliancy? How much of an ongoing process is it? Or do you just kind of, you get there and then it's done and you're good for a year until you have to redo certifications? But just, just like as an example. Yeah, I... I, that's that's a interesting question. So I, I kind of want to take the angle of the customer and talk about it from a customer perspective. So yeah. a lot of um, a lot of companies, a lot of I, I'm, I'm going to say probably small to medium sized medical practices actually signed up with JotForm and the HIPAA solution here during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So part of the reason was a lot of medical offices have paper forms uh, that need to be filled out. And, you know, as they moved to telemedicine, they needed a way to put those paper forms online in a secure way. So essentially what JotForm Super Compliant Version offers then is the ability to actually integrate a form builder into your business process so that this medical practice can take everything that used to be paper-based and just put it online. So... Um, you know, now JotForm becomes a data processor in that case, but the, the medical office is still the data owner, okay. right? So I think, what does it take to comply with HIPAA? Well, it's not as simple as just clicking a button, I want to upgrade my JotForm account to HIPAA, because they're not outsourcing their HIPAA compliance to us, right? They are contracting with JotForm to be a form builder that, that forms one part 
of their business process. But ultimately, what they do with that data is up to them, and they need to ensure that they are uh, safeguarding that data, both inside and outside of job form, and tracking who within their medical pro uh, practice views that data and for what reasons in order to stay fully compliant with the law. So it is a lot more complex than just clicking a button and saying, uh, you know, I'm going to trust a third party to do that. Now, in terms of uh, what do we have to do on an annual basis? Well, there are a number of different controls uh, that we have to essentially prove that we are following. Um, and that Im involves uh, some testing and some auditing. So, um, you know, that's, that's uh, a part, part of the job that, you know, certainly mm -hmm. uh, requires some time and attention as well. Sure. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sure it does. Uh, I, I think that's a good point you, you make, though, right? Just because you have a HIPAA-compliant form builder doesn't mean your organization is immediately HIPAA-compliant. It's still, all, still on every organization to maintain their own HIPAA compliancy and make sure that they do have HIPAA-compliant vendors and, and partners like JotForm, but it's part of a, a bigger picture uh, for any healthcare practice to, to stay compliant. Um, yeah, I think that's a valuable takeaway. I guess... <clears throat> We never really did this at the beginning, but again, just hearing you you talk about this and and obviously your your in depth knowledge on the on the subject matter, I, I guess I'm just a little bit curious. How did you personally get started off on this information security path? You know, can you walk us through a little bit of your your background, your training, how how you ended up in a role like this? Uh, whether you you know you went to school for it or you worked your way through it, or yeah, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, so interestingly enough, I think, um, you know, a lot of people in the industry are, you know, they're looking to hire folks that have 20 plus years of experience in information security. But 20 plus years ago, there almost were no, yeah, no people say. in information security, right? So the demand for talent in this field is actually much larger than the supply. Interesting. And so I actually came from, uh, from IT and software development. So I was not a security professional early in my career. Um, I was actually a software engineer. Okay. And from there, I went on to be, uh, hold several different um, roles, either in uh, project management or in IT operations. Um, and uh, finally, in uh, architecture, enterprise architecture of, of large scale business systems. And then um, that experience finally led me to the opportunity about uh, eight years ago uh, to transition into information security, where I was given the op opportunity prior to joining JotForm, I was given the opportunity to really start a cybersecurity company from, uh, I'm sorry, started a cybersecurity program from mm -hmm. the ground up at a, um, a pretty small startup at the time. Um, you know, so I spent um, about six years there building this program and, uh, you know, building out all of the aspects of people, process, and technology that are required to mature. Uh, a cybersecurity program, you know, while I was at that company, we also grew um, in size by about 300%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of supporting the company growth and um, building out a function. And I think that experience really positioned me well for uh, the head of information security role here at JotForm. So I've been here a little bit less than a year. Um, you know, the starting point at JotForm was a lot higher than um, my previous company. So here at JotForm, I, I uh, took over a, a, a good team that had really some solid capabilities. And really what I'm here to do is just level up that team and bring the capabilities just to the next level of maturity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you have a, a pretty diversified background that's enabled you to oversee several of these things like the project management and sort of the the enterprise infrastructure ownership of building a team uh, would you say your your software engineering like foundation comes into play in your in your role a lot like could you be conversant in a lot of these technical processes without having that software engineer background specifically I think um, if if someone is looking to get into cybersecurity, I think um, either a software engineering or a system administration background are, are probably the two 
right. uh, foundational paths. So essentially, folks on my team who are part of the application security team are typically software engineers by background, and people who are part of the infrastructure team, infrastructure security may be more like a Linux administrator, system mm -hmm. network administrator. And usually having those foundational skills on either the software or the hardware side will basically uh, help you uh, have a foundation to grow on, right? And then you take on the security dimension of one of those uh, two uh, and really develop expertise with the, within that uh, field. Right. Uh, so I, I would say, um, yes, my software uh, engineering background serves me to some extent, although uh, that was a long time ago and the, <laughs> the programming languages we use are different. I'm sure. However, you know, the ability to read code or read pseudocode to review kind of uh, the application and to understand the application logic, um, I think generally is, is pretty valuable in security. Absolutely. And you said we, you know, we're, we're still a pretty small, young company, um, still growing. You mentioned we're, we're lean and mean. Uh, out of curiosity, is most of your day-to-day -day admin managerial tasks, or are you still kind of in the trenches sometimes and, and working with the, the nitty-gritty of, of some of these components that you oversee? Yeah, it really depends. So, you know, in some days it's more about strategic roadmap and kind of figuring out what it is that we need to do and making sure that we get the right uh, priorities and level of attention. And in some days it's more, you know, we have a particular issue that we need to solve, right? And, you know, I may not be hands on keyboard solving, but, you know, certainly, you know, sitting shoulder sh to shoulder with uh, an individual on my team and talking through the issue and kind of helping troubleshoot. So it's it's really a combination. Yeah, which makes sense. And that's how it should be, I think, at the end of the day. Um, yeah, well, th well, thanks for indulging all these questions. I've just been kind of curious, what does a head of information security at a company like this do? So that was uh, that was helpful. But we can get back kind of to more of the uh, immediate topic, I guess, in sort of a, a, a broader sense. I guess if we sh if we shift the focus back to sort of the current day, um, what would you say <clears throat> in a in a general sense is the biggest threat to a company's data in today's day and age? You know, you hear about cyber attacks, uh, obviously negligence, misuse. Like in in a nutshell, what would you say is the thing that companies need to watch out for the most when it comes to their information security? Yeah, so I think cyber attacks are getting more and more common, certainly. And um, even if you're running a small company, um, nobody is immune to cyber mm -hmm. attacks. So I would certainly start by um, ensuring that I have at least some level of protection. Um, you know, so essentially, um, there are so many automated attacks out there that are, you know, uh, either looking for... Um, open servers that they can log into with default passwords. There's uh, automated phishing attacks that are targeting not uh, you know only the high-end companies, but really anyone out mm -hmm. there and you know who's going to fall for it. And then um, if um, someone clicks on a phishing link that that attacker may have access to your system and you don't even know it. Hmm. So I would say probably no one is really safe, right? So every company, whether you're a small startup or a big company, you're going to need some sort of cybersecurity program. Now, you know, in many small companies, you can probably outsource that. And, um, you know, I'm not here to recommend specific vendors for that, but there are companies that can give you kind of a fractional CISO or, you know, someone who is from the outside can help you establish your security policies and can certainly do things like penetration tests to, to test the robustness of your security controls. Even if you have just a small office with a network server and a couple of people, it might be uh, smart to, to look at that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other thing that I think... Um, is a big as a big threat is uh, essentially just not knowing um, what your responsibilities are regarding the data, right? So anyone who collects data uh, becomes that the data owner, right? And now mm -hmm. they have responsibilities toward 
uh, all of the end users who submitted data, and they need to make sure that they safeguard that data. Now, JotForm can be part of that solution, and you know certainly we do uh, our part in uh, securing the, uh, the 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 code and the servers that the data is residing on. But there are many ways that a data owner can make mistakes that you know could be costly for them, could expose data. And you know, just not knowing uh, kind of the regulations around data, I think is is uh, is a, a, it's a big threat as well. Yeah, I think that's that's an important distinction, right? Because you know, JotForm, we we're a form builder, we're a quote unquote data collection company, but we're not collecting data for ourselves. We facilitate other people being able to collect data for their own needs. So we can do our part and make sure that that we're buttoned up. But it really does come down to just every individual user or small business owner or whoever it is who is needing the data for whatever reason, they still need to do you know their part at the end of the day and make sure their yeah. their staff and, are at least you know, well enough to understand that. JotForm is so easy to use, right? So uh, you know you can end up becoming by subscribing to JotForm or other solutions, you kind of end up becoming a accidental IT administrator mm -hmm. for your small business, right. right? And I guess my point is uh, that IT administrator at your small business actually comes with a lot of responsibility, whether you know it or not. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, I encourage those folks to take a closer look at what those responsibilities are. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't think you can uh, overstate that enough. I guess, would you say, wh what kinds of companies would you say are sort of especially susceptible to, to data security companies? Is it really every sort of, every company out there? Is it more like the technology companies who operate more in the cloud than others? Or is it really, you know, every single company is, is susceptible to this kind of thing? So, um, you know, I think... Like I said, there's many attackers who are just hunting uh, out on their on the internet for anything that's available. Uh, those attacks are not targeted, right? So I think um, you know anyone who has a server of some sort, whether it's on the cloud or, uh, or on premises, and anyone who has a business email system uh, is susceptible to some types of attacks, right? Mm. But I guess the bigger your company is, the larger your threat surface, mm -hmm. um, and you know also you're gonna uh, the larger companies will get attention from maybe a different category of attackers. Sure. So um, I guess the main difference is the more sophisticated attackers are moving really fast. Um, you know that's part of how um, information security has evolved, right? Is um, ransomware attacks that maybe used to take days can now take minutes, right? So because attackers are moving so fast, the defenders have to be really fast too. So I had this, uh, you know, kind of queued up to ask after, but, um, you know, how data security, how information security just has evolved over the years. And I think this is a, is a good segue for it because, as you mentioned, 20 years ago, this field was barely existent. Yes, there is still IT, there is still information security to be had, but uh, we have seen such a robust growth just with online data and the digital information age that we're in now uh, that it has really evolved, I presume. So you kind of just touched on it a little bit. Now it's gotten faster and you have to be able to adapt more. Uh, but, you know, in your experience in, in the field, like how has it really changed even over the last decade to, to where you are now? Yeah. Yeah, so I mentioned, you know, even when I started uh, more in the IT and system software engineering space, there were just a few professionals who were information security or cybersecurity professionals, and they were kind of locked up in a room by themselves mm -hmm. and didn't really talk to many other people, right? So the um, cybersecurity has now evolved to the point where I believe it really needs to be part of everybody's mission. Mm -hmm. So I really... Um, you know, go to great lengths to educate my colleagues on, you know, why cybersecurity is important. And, you know, through that communication and education, you know, rally people around the fact that uh, cybersecurity is part of everybody's mission here at JOTSFORM. 
So whether you're in marketing or whether you're in sales, um, you know, whether you're in human resources, uh, you know, if you see something, say something, first of all, right? So we do have, um, you know, phishing campaigns that are um, targeted towards different job categories where, you know, we'd like to hear from our end users as soon as possible if they see something suspicious. We want them to know that they can always partner with us. You know, it's a it's a non-retribution non type mm -hmm. of analysis even if they clicked on a bad phishing link you know we're not going to punish anyone for for that we really need them to report it so that we can solve the problem before it's too late right. and you know so general awareness training uh we do that every year for our employees and you know i have other kind of methods to try to rally rally the troops around um cybersecurity being everyone's mission. And I think that's kind of one of the main ways that the field has changed. It's come kind of uh, out into the limelight a lot more mm -hmm. and has become a mainstream topic that, uh, that you hear about, you know, whether, you know, just in casual conversations and certainly in the boardroom and so forth, uh, cybersecurity is a topic that everyone uh, now wants to hear about. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a buzzword these days, I think. Uh, but, but you make a good point because anyone in the company can now get a, a phishing email. You know, it says it's from the CEO of the company, like, oh, they, they need some help or they need some feedback or something. And it can sometimes look pretty realistic. If you know, if you know what you're looking for, you can always tell. But if you haven't been trained and you aren't familiar, like, oh, man, like a, an executive at the company is asking for me, me for something, I got to get back to them. Uh, that's where, you know, those those hackers can sort of gain a foothold. Uh, and it really is kind of on the company yeah. to do that. And those 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 scams are sometimes there uh, can be low impact, but you know you still want to avoid them. And it's very common that uh, those scams are actually um, targeting new hires. Mm, that's interesting. You know, so uh, you know potentially attackers are looking at LinkedIn profiles to see when someone changed their job. And then they either um, guess at their email address, or, the, or they can obtain their email address. But I've I've even seen new employees being um, texted on their personal cell phones. Yep. So, yep. Uh, you know, too. and the, the kind of the basic level scam is someone who pretends to be your CEO or a high level um, official. They're in an important meeting. They can't talk right now, but they need you yep. to do them a favor. Yep. And the favor typically involves buying gift cards and then uh, just sending them the gift card numbers because they need to make some kind of purchase. And, um, you know, it's surprising, you know, not at Jotform, but surprising number of people that I've run into have actually fallen for those type of scams. Mm. So in my uh, previous company, we did implement a policy that if you get some, you know, weird instruction, whether it's um, the specific example or like if the finance department gets an instruction to change the wire transfer uh, instructions on a payment, for example, that they, they always need to confirm it by making a voice call. Don't you know, uh, follow these kind of instructions blindly just by reading a text message or an email because the scammer uh, you know, is hiding behind layers of technology to impersonate your CEO, but they're right. not likely to sound like your CEO right. when, if you call them back on a known number. If you call your CEO back on a known number, then you know, most likely it, they're going to tell you, no, that wasn't me, right? right? So always try to confirm before you do something that sounds uh, unreasonable yep and if you're you know too hesitant to contact your ceo at least contact your manager and they'll probably have a, a good answer for you right right speaking speaking the truth it's to, to some might be common sense but to, to others especially people who haven't been exposed to uh phishing attacks like this before uh it might not be so i think that's a that's a good policy. You 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 mentioned a little while ago that uh, attacks are getting quicker. Like what what took days before is now taking minutes. Out of curiosity, what is that a facet of? Is it people are getting better, faster at coding? Is it algorithms getting better? Is it bots getting better? Like why is there this acceleration uh, in information security fraud that now we're having to counter on on our end? 
Well, I guess the, the, the attackers have gotten a little more sophisticated just in terms of scripting out their attacks. Mm. So while in the past, you know, someone may have gotten a foothold on one of your servers and then, you know, they just manually execute some commands to poke around and see what else they can get access to, the more modern attacks basically uh, have automated toolkits, essentially. Hmm. So all you need is a... Is a uh, admin rights on a server essentially and then they can execute a toolkit that you know basically encrypts all your files on any server that's connected to that device so you know those kind of automated scripts and toolkits certainly make make it a lot faster um, but also those um, you know um, automated scripts are a little bit easier to detect because basically the defenders also you know now know what they're looking for and um you know can't really give away the specifics on how we would defend against that right but there are ways to essentially detect um behavior uh that is anomalous and that mm -hmm. basically might indicate the presence of an attacker um, you know, so the defenders are also using automation and scripts to to essentially be able to detect this type of behavior or attack faster. Oh, it's interesting. Fight fire with fire. Uh, I guess <laughs> on that on that note, like, what, what do you say are some common steps that um, either technology companies, small businesses, just most companies in general are doing now to address uh, privacy data concerns? You know, you mentioned um, the just having training for employees and uh, educating them on on these types of attacks. Is there anything else like sort of low hanging fruit that that most companies you're, you're seeing are starting to do more and more? Yeah, I think it, it kind of a low hanging fruit is uh, really protecting your um, account credentials, whether it be email or mm -hmm. uh, any other systems. Or um, you know, if if it's a mission critical tool, um, put a strong password on it. Implement multi factor authentication if that's available. That's definitely um, gotten more popular. I, I've I, I heard a statistic recently that. Um, Something as high as ninety-four percent of attacks um, are related to a compromised credential. So mm -hmm. either a login ID, password, or any uh, uh, another way to basically gain access to systems through a compromised credential. So if you can use long or complex passwords, and especially if you can put multi-factor authentication on your accounts, um, it's basically uh, a way to thwart a lot of attacks. Right. Yeah. So that would be the low-hanging fruit, to safeguard uh, the identity of your individuals to make sure that uh, that identity isn't compromised. Definitely. And I feel like, you know, just awareness of that has changed. You know, you see it, whatever site you're using, I feel like most sites, they have the, the parameters for when you enter, when you create a new account, uh, your password has to be 10 characters long, include a special character, include a number, has to have all these uh, attributes to it that make it longer, more complicated, harder to to guess or or algorithmically, um, you know, hack. And I don't think that, I don't remember that being the case like 10 years ago when I was you know, trying to sign on to, you know, AOL or, or anything like MySpace. Uh, you didn't see all those warnings and parameters around login data. Um, but you start to see that a lot more these days. And it seems like a lot of websites yeah. are also asking if you want to two-factor authenticate. Um, and some are, some are even requiring you to do it. Like my, yeah. I'm in an online master's program and it requires two-factor authentication every single time. Uh, no, you don't have a choice about it. Um, I think that that might be the future of, of more and more companies maybe. I think that's absolutely the best policy. Yep. And, um, you know, in addition to that, um, Try not to reuse the passwords between different systems that that you're using because essentially, if one gets compromised, um, essentially a, an attacker can now be armed with a, a password list yep. that they got from some previous breach, right? right? And like I said, attacks are getting faster, and that includes automated logon attempts. Mm. So uh, essentially, if you're uh, the system that you're trying to protect. Uh, doesn't have a timeout or a maximum attempt limit before it locks the account. Uh, an attacker can essentially, we call it a spray and pray attack. They spray the system with all kinds of 
password attempts and they pray that one of them is valid. Right. And eventually they might get in using that technique. So, um, you know, don't reuse your passwords and try to um, put multi-factor on as many accounts as possible is probably the best kind of low-hanging fruit advice I would give. Yep, yep, you heard it here, folks. Uh, take it seriously. Um, and don't get lazy with your passwords. Uh, how would consumers uh, identify companies that have high information security standards? Because as we sort of talked about, awareness has never been higher. Cybersecurity is a buzzword now. Many more companies are investing into it. But if you're, if you're a consumer and you're especially worried about your data or the sensitivity of it, and you have several different options in what company to, to entrust that data with, uh, what can be a different differentiating factor? What should you be looking for as a consumer um, for security information? Yeah, so, you know, certainly you should be looking for the type of uh, certifications that uh, are relevant for, for your industry. So if you're uh, healthcare, you should be looking for providers that, that do offer HIPAA compliant yep. solutions. If you're looking to process credit cards, you definitely need uh, a provider that that does have a PCI DSS certification. Um, you know, another thing that is getting big uh, is called the SOC two framework, and um, I think by the time this podcast is published, Elliot um, Dotform may actually have our. Uh, SOC 2 certification in hand. Okay, interesting. So this is a this is a pretty big uh, industry uh, certification that essentially shows the uh, customers that we have implemented and uh, follow a certain set of security controls to safeguard our systems and and data. And that's something that you know more and more customers are asking for, especially the enterprise customers, I'm sure. because it's now become such a standard uh, certification in the industry that instead of an enterprise customer doing kind of a custom review of JotForm and sending us questionnaires, um, you know, asking us to fill out a bunch of questions about how we, uh, you know, do this, that, and the other, if we can just send them a SOC two report that basically shows how we're meeting uh, 161 uh, controls across wow. five different categories. It's much easier for the customer to kind of consume that. Definitely. And it's also easier for us, right? Um, yes, we have to go through an audit with a third party, um, uh, show evidence of compliance and it, it's time consuming. But once we have that report, um, it makes it now less time consuming to prove to each customer that we actually have the security framework in place that they're looking for. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a win-win on all counts, it sounds like, and just more more efficient at the end of the day. SOC 2. Okay, we'll see if this is out. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think well, this will be published first week, of, first week of August, so we'll see if we get there by then. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. Um, so flipping, flipping the script a little bit, that's sort of your advice on, on what a consumer should look for in a company. What if you are a company, like let's say a startup or a small business, um, and you know you're, you're kind of just getting your 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 roots in the ground and building out your business? Uh, what advice would you give someone in this position, uh, mom and pop shop, say, uh, regarding their information security practices? Like, where do they even begin in this all expansive topic? Yeah, I would say, you know, for starters is don't ignore information uh, security. It's mm -hmm. not something that you can live without. So, you know, as you sit down and prioritize kind of how how are you going to build your business in, in year one, I think it's absolutely a topic that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Now, do you need to hire a full-time information security professional? Probably not. Um, you know, many of our customers don't even have a full-time IT system administrator, right? right. So, but um, invest in a little bit of training and education for the person that, you know, is going to be the, the, the designee that's going to handle the data and the systems. Invest in a little bit of uh, security education for starters and maybe a little bit of consulting services to make sure that you are, in fact, uh, protecting your systems and data in a sufficient manner, because guess what? If there is a breach and um, and um, you are not prepared, mm -hmm. you're going to suffer the consequences, and it's probably going to be a lot more costly than mm -hmm. investing those dollars up front. Right. 
Right. Yeah, no, uh, you make you make excellent points all around. Basically, take it seriously, uh, no matter what industry you might be in as a small business. As we discussed, if you have any presence online or use any servers, you are uh, under some sort of potential risk for this. So take it seriously, invest, and just uh, just get educated somehow or bring on the right people who are. So I think that's that's excellent advice. Any uh, any closing points, Johannes, that we we might have missed? I think we covered everything that that I had on on my list. It's definitely been uh, educational. Uh, anything else that uh, we maybe didn't cover that would be good to good to leave off on? Yeah, I guess I kind of want to leave off on what I see as kind of a common thread for building uh, a successful security program. Mm-hmm. And I kind of see it as a three-legged stool where you have to invest in people, process, and technology to be mm-hmm. successful. And I think, um, you know, we didn't really talk about technology solutions here because this is not really a technical podcast. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I, I fear that a lot of people, um, you know, put too much faith in the technology. And they think that there's going to be a magic silver bullet that's going to solve all their uh, security pro- uh, problems such as such a technology doesn't exist right? right so you have to combine the technology with the right people who know to, how to use and operate that piece of technology so you need you know some sophisticated people who can uh, whether they you know code or can do system administration and uh, and so forth like we talked about before mm-hmm. and then the third th- leg of the stool is you also have to have good solid processes so essentially, um, you know, what I'm trying to do here at Jotform is kind of raise the stool, if you will, by raising all the three legs of that stool simultaneously, making sure that we don't miss anything, um, you know, acquire the right pieces of um, technical solutions when needed, but ensure that I have, uh, uh, you know, c- capable staff that is trained on using that technology correctly, and that I also have really solid processes to make sure that um, you know, I can account for, um, you know, what changes we made to the system, how we tested those changes, how we protected the customer's data and so forth, and, and um, be able to provide evidence because that's ultimately what auditors then ask for is evidence that right. you followed those processes. So I would say the final uh, closing remark is that, you know, you can't really... Um, you can't really build a program without uh, considering all three of uh, these aspects. That's really important perspective. Yeah, the three-legged stool, like you said, people, process, and technology. You can't just rely on on one. They all have to work in in tandem, even even regardless of the tech that you're using. So. That's wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Johannes. This has been, like I said, very informative for for me personally, very educational. Uh, It's remarkable to think just how much goes into information security. And it's a world that so many of us might not be familiar with, but it's important to be, uh, at least on a service level, and to to be aware of of some of these components. Um, So thank you so much for lending your, your time and expertise today. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. This was fun. (laughs) It was. All right. Have a good one. (laughs) All right. Take care, Elliot.